Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario. I'm going to go ahead and go around the room. Everyone, please introduce yourselves. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just kidding. So, <clears throat> why are you here? Yeah, why are you here? It's Saturday. What are you doing here? Seriously, why are you here? Uh, I don't know why you're here, and that's your business. Uh, why I am here is because uh, I want to, come on, do it, there you go. Uh, I want to talk about how I uh, taught myself to read a language called Clojure. Um, so <clears throat> I am a developer from St. Louis. Uh, I have been doing uh, OO programming for, uh, uh, I don't know, a long time, since the 90s somethings. Um, and uh, I'm involved in a user group in St. Louis. I organize a group called uh, the Lambda Lounge. Lambda Lounge is a group that is uh, a collection of people that have an in interest in functional and dynamic programming languages. I've got a, a long uh, history with uh, the Ruby programming language, which is an object-oriented uh, imperative programming language, but I've al always been interested in functional programming languages. And uh, Clojure is a functional language. Um, the, my interest in learning languages is something that I have had for uh, a long time, and it's something that's influenced my uh, development style as a, as a programmer. Uh, thinking about problems in different ways uh, helps me change and adapt and I think be a better programmer. Uh, Clojure is a language that does not look like any language uh, that I had ever programmed in before. Uh, Clojure is a Lisp. Uh, let me get a show of hands. Who in this room knows Lisp? Any of the Lisps? A few folks, not a lot. Uh, for everyone else, uh, everyone else, presumably you're in some kind of an imperative programming language, Java, C Sharp, raise your hand, something like that. Maybe how about other functional programming languages? Erlang, Haskell, Clojure, anyone? Scala, thank you. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> what I want to do is kind of go over how uh, the Clojure programming language uh, syntax works and hopefully once you can wrap your, your eye around the way that it works, uh, the ideas that are part of the language that was designed by uh, a really smart developer named Rich Hickey, uh, who is building on ideas that have been around since the 50s, um, that those ideas will trickle in and hopefully find a place in your head and inform you in terms of how you approach developing software. Um, so what I want to do is start off with um, object-oriented languages. So in OO, you've got nouns. Uh, nouns are like the predominant concept in object-oriented languages, where nouns are these concepts that you might model as classes, and those classes may have relationships with other nouns. And what the nouns do is they verb other nouns, where you might have a user, which is a noun, and the user has emails. Email is another noun. And you might associate an email with a user by setting the user uh, the user's email. You might also have a pitcher, so pitcher pitches. So you've got a noun verbing uh, a batter with a curve. Uh, more specifically, you might say that the pitcher pitches a curved ball to a batter. So you've got nouns verbing other nouns. So <clears throat> yeah, nouns verbing other nouns. The way that the OO languages uh, tend to be read is left to right. You've got, and it's very readable. I mean, the, it's naturally, to, at least to the Western eye, reading from left to, light, left to right makes a lot of sense. You can read exactly what's going on. The pitcher pitches a curveball to the batter. Easy to understand. So in OO, you've got uh, this set of concepts that are uh, objects or uh, instances of classes that are these concepts. And those objects, they have relationships to other objects, and the way that they interact with other objects, is, objects are through messages. The, the verbing is all messages, where you're invoking some kind of a behavior that's been associated with an object uh, by means of calling some kind of a method or something like that. So that's how OO works. Closure, though, is a lisp. Closure is not an, it's not an OO language. The, the basis of closure, instead of um, objects, is parentheses. So, I'm sorry? Yes, 
Indeed, I think it actually does. Uh, so you can thank John McCarthy for that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> Lisps have parentheses, and so what um, what Closure does? Come on, animation. Yep. So what Closure does is it takes those parentheses and wraps them around everything to make lots of lists. Uh, in Closure, you've got this. Uh, there's a distinction between two concepts that actually kind of bleed into each other. You've got code and you've got data. Where code is a thing that operates on data, but code can also be represented as data. In fact, you can interpret code as data and data as code. It's this sort of snake eating its own tail thing uh, with closure that's actually very powerful. Um, come on. OK, so closure deals in lists in lists of all kinds of things. Uh, the parentheses are these things that uh, bound uh, the contents of your list. So the things that are in uh, lists of things, uh, you can have all kinds of stuff in lists, but these are some of the examples of the kinds of lists that exist in Clojure. So uh, one kind of list are lists that are represented with parentheses. The little single quote at the beginning of it, I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, another kind of list is a vector. So a vector is just a list that has these square brackets. You've got another kind of list that's a set. So sets are uh, lists that have uh, unique items. You can't have more than one of, an I of a particular kind of item in the set. You also have maps uh, that are key value pairs. Uh, so one of the things about lists in Clojure, uh, in fact, in Clojure in general, is that things that are sort of white spacey uh, really aren't necessary. Uh, closure doesn't care about, uh, it considers commas as white space uh, and it doesn't really care. You can put commas in there if you want to, but the language doesn't care. It's, it's just not part of the syntax. Uh, and this example of the map is not really a good one, um, but you can have numbers as the keys and values in your map, uh, but this is probably more common, something that you would see, uh, something that's where you've got a key of hands and a uh, value of two and then a key of limbs and a value of four. I'll explain what those colons are in a second. But all of these things uh, are uh, lists uh, of items, and Lisp is uh, Lisp and Clojure are full of these things. Everything is uh, evaluated in the context of some kind of a list. Uh, so these collections are what are called uh, persistent data structures. All of the ways that Clojure has of uh, managing data structures uh, is uh, treating them as persistent data structures. So let's talk about what that means. What this, uh, what's going on here is that we've got a function. So we've got a function called concat, and concat is being passed a vector of one and two, and then a, another vector of three. When this function is evaluated, what comes out is uh, a sequence of the values one, two, and three. So <clears throat> you have three different data structures here. Uh, the first data structure is one, two, the other data structure is three, a vector of three, and then the third data structure is the sequence of one, two, three. Uh, closure does not change the contents of lists of the data structures. Data structures are immutable. Whenever you modify a data structure, whether it is a list or a set or a vector or a map, what you actually get back in the modification is a brand new collection that has all of the contents of the old one plus whatever changes you've made in whatever your, the operation that you applied on that collection. Uh, one of the advantages of that, and this is actually kind of a big idea, uh, one of the most challenging problems in programming is uh, mutable data. When you have uh, some collection of data that could change based on any kind of interaction, Tracking down what is causing that change and guarding it is something that we spend non-trivial amounts of time on. One of the things that the closure language gives you for free, basically, are these data structures that will never change. If you have a reference to a particular data structure that has some data in it, it'll always be there for as long as you are looking at it. You can make changes to it, but what you get back in the changing operations is a pointer to a different uh, data structure that has the original data plus or minus whatever the effect of the change was. So in that way they're persistent. It doesn't mean that they're persistent in the sense of like a database. They're persistent in, in that they are always the same. 
so <clears throat> enclosure data structures are declared. They are not assigned. You don't have, in, as in imperative languages, where you may have something equals something else. Closure doesn't work that way. When you have data structures, you declare them by some kind of name. So I've got a data structure here that I have called uh, Mario's favorite langs. Uh, and it's a vector that has these two values, Ruby and CoffeeScript. What I can do uh, with this data structure <coughs> is that I can uh, see what its value is. So its value is uh, Ruby and CoffeeScript. I can also call a function that's going to uh, try to change the data structure by reassigning whatever is at the first index of the data structure, uh, index one, which is the second position, uh, change its value from whatever it is into closure. And so then what comes out of that is a brand new data structure that has Ruby and closure. Uh, but my original one is still intact. It'll always be there. Uh, anything that is holding on to that original one will always see those two same values. So <clears throat> manipulating data structures in closure yields new data structures. Closure is a functional programming language. So where closure deals in lists of things, um, the lists are operated on by functions. In OO languages, you have objects, classes, and methods. In functional programming languages, you've got functions. Uh, you don't have classes, you've got functions. So let's have a look. <clears throat> so what I have here is something that looks like it's inside of a list. So closure uses parentheses to denote the scope of something that's going to be evaluated. So this could look like, let me turn my phone off. This could look like a list, um, but it's actually a, a sequence of values that are going to be evaluated as a function. So <clears throat> the way to read this is, as with the OO left to right um, paradigm, it works the same way. It reads uh, and or evaluates left to right in this example. You've got this function pitch that takes these two parameters, ball and batter. Um, pitch, ball, and batter are three um, symbols in the uh, language that point to, um, you'll have to just trust me, they point to a function and then two uh, data structures. But they don't necessarily have to be two data structures. They're just two other things. These two things, uh, ball and batter, are being passed in to the function pitch. So this, is, this style of uh, function invocation is called prefix notation. So where in an imperative language, you may, uh, an imperative language that uses infix notation, you may see something that's like two plus five. In prefix notation, the function that you're applying to the parameters is the first argument. And everything that follows are arguments into that function. This is one of the things that for me was, it took a while to get used to. But uh, I mean, not just the function goes first, because that's just not how you learn things in school and not how I learn things. But the function going first and then the parameter second, once I got used to that concept is first is the thing that you're doing and everything else is what you're doing it to. Um, then my I could read the language a lot better. Also, the thing about parentheses, so, so far I've only shown you a couple. I'm going to show you a lot more <laughs> later on. But they tend to melt away. That's one of the things that for me, when I first would see languages like Clojure or Haskell, I would see things that my eye just couldn't like parse. But eventually, I started making sense of what I was seeing. And the things that are just that set the boundaries, they would just sort of melt away. OK. So that's prefix notation. When, so here are more parentheses. Here we have another set of uh, function calls. But these are nested function calls, um, where the, the previous example I showed you was evaluation of left to right. Um, when you've got nested fu function calls, it's a little bit different. It's really more kind of like evaluating inside out. And there's a reason for that. So what's going on here is that there's a function called generate count that I'm going to pass whatever this thing is in the middle plus this other thing. This is going to be a thing, and inning is, is a thing. But the thing that's in the middle is another function call. So <clears throat> the way that Clojure figures this out is it says, OK, you want to invoke generate count. 
and you're going to pass in something. In order to do that, I've got to figure out what's going on on the inside. So the inside is this function called pitch that's being passed uh, ball and batter. So the way that Clojure reads this is it starts from the inside of the thing, figures out what the return value is of uh, pitch ball to batter, and then the return of that is going to be the parameter for the outside call generate count. So uh, once it figures out uh, what pitch ball batter uh, returns, then it's going to invoke generate count with that return value plus whatever inning is. So one thing to remember is your eye is a muscle. It's not really a muscle, but let's just say that it is a muscle. <laughs> Closure definitely treats your eye as a muscle because one of the things that it's going to help you do is it's going to help you get your muscles stronger going left to right. With closure, you're going to be looking left to right all the time because you're going to have to figure out, you're going to go into the function and then you're going to have to go back, go back out. Wait, what is this really doing? And then you go back in. What, what, what's going on here? And then you go back out. So your muscle is going to get really strong. You're going to have like bulging eye pecs. <laughs> right. OK, so things that can go into lists. Uh, so there are a number of things that can go into lists. Uh, numbers, a thing called keywords, I'll explain those in a second, symbols, and other lists. You can put everything in lists. Lisps love lists. All right, so let's talk about numbers. Um, so uh, Clojure is a language that has numbers, it has integers, uh, everyone knows about those floating points. Uh, Clojure is one of the few languages that I know of uh, that has rational numbers. I think this is awesome. Rational numbers are the things that we learned in elementary school that no programming languages that I've used before now use. And there are, so I'm, I'm not a mathematician. Perhaps in Mathematica or other um, mathematically oriented uh, environments, uh, rational numbers are just like a thing, it's like whatever. But in the rest of the world just didn't catch on to it. But this is fantastic that there are numbers that can be represented just simply like that. And the, the uh, programming language um, can work with that, and that's fantastic. Uh, closure is uh, something that can also do number promotion. So uh, one thing I have forgotten to mention uh, until now is that Clojure is a language that runs on the JVM. Yay, JVM, Java, super. So uh, one of the things that that gives you is access to the entire Java ecosystem. Java is a language that has these primitive uh, numeric types, uh, ints and floats and doubles and then uh, object wrappers that wrap those things. Um, so Clojure is, is a language on top of uh, the JVM that can deal with either numbers uh, as, uh, as the regular integer values, but can also promote things because uh, in Java, you've got numbers, uh, ints, that have a range of values that they can hold that pass those, they'll overflow into the negative space. And Clojure can do that, but it can also promote numbers once they get past the storable range uh, for one kind of number type. It'll bump them up to the next kind of number type and then off the races. You can store a lot more into that. And it can do that for you, uh, but it doesn't have to do that for you. And that's one of the great things about uh, the language. It gives you options in that way, at least with numbers. Keywords. So keywords are a thing in Clojure. Um, <coughs> keywords uh, are these uh, symbols that have their prefix by a colon and then have some number of characters after them. And there are all kinds of characters that you can put into keywords. Um, they're called keywords because you're most likely to use them as keys inside some kind of a data structure, probably an associated data structure like a map. Uh, so the, the common style in Clojure is uh, what is called by a couple of different names. Kebab case is the, case is the way that I like to call it because I love kebabs and food. Uh, some call it um, dash case, um, but kebab case. Everyone here, please call it kebab case. I'm like an advocate for kebab case because kebabs are fantastic. So let's all call, them, let's all call it kebab case. Uh, so keywords. Keywords, you're most likely to use them in maps. And so this is an example of using a map uh, and a function called get. So Clojure, uh, the Clojure core comes with a function called get, uh, which is a function that will operate on maps. So you hand um, get the map that you want to pull something out of, and you hand it the key that is uh, the thing in the map that some kind of a value is associated with. So when you pass the map and the key, it'll return back whatever the value that corresponds to that key inside of the map. Straightforward. Another thing that you can do um, with uh, keywords and maps and closure is that you can just say, well, I'll take the map and almost treat it like a function. 
and pass to that function this parameter of this sum key keyword. It doesn't matter what the key is. But it's treating a data structure as a function. Remember I said before about code and data, data and code, it's like this whole big thing. So that's really cool. That you can say, OK, map, I'm going to mash a keyword at you. And if you've got the keyword, just give me the value, just kind of mash it in there. I like mashing things. You can also do this. This is also a cool thing. OK, keyword, I'm going to throw a map at you. Just mash it together. Whatever comes out is going to be the value. The reason why these things work both for keywords and maps is that both of them behind the scenes, they implement this interface called IFN. And what IFN uh, allows you to do is treat something as a function. So code, data, mushing together. All right, that's keywords and maps. Symbols. So symbols are uh, anything that has uh, anything, any named thing that lives inside of the namespace uh, that you happen to be in, or any other namespace that exists in the universe. Um, so <clears throat> symbols are the things that are, um, they, they can either be uh, data structures that have some kind of a, a name to them, uh, or a function. Uh, symbols point to those things uh, so that you can use them. So <clears throat> uh, values. So symbols, values. Um, here we have uh, a value called Mario's Twitter. Um, and the value has a symbol name of Mario's Twitter. And the value of that symbol is uh, at Mario Kino, my, my Twitter account. Uh, so that's values. That's, uh, again, more things that you can put into lists and closure. You can also put functions. So functions, uh, you can treat them as values. You can pass them around. Let's talk about how to declare functions. So this is one way to declare a function enclosure. <clears throat> I want to talk about what exactly is uh, going on here. So you've got this function called uh, mix that takes this parameter of things. So the way to express uh, the, the parameter set that you can pass into a function closure is with as a vector, so the square brackets. In here, I'm passing in something that I'm calling foods, and I've got this ampersand in front of it. So the ampersand means uh, I'm treating anything that gets passed into this function just under a single name, and I will do something to that name in the code of the function. But I don't want to, like, so any number of things. So in Java, this would be like a var args kind of a parameter declaration. What this means is that you can pass any kind of thing into this function, and I will just treat anything you pass in under just this one name. So what happens inside of this function is that I'm creating this uh, associative data structure where I've got this key of mixture. And mixture is something that's outside of the scope of this slide, but it's a symbol to something. I've got contents of foods, and that's whatever got passed in. And I've got this taste interesting. And interesting is something that, again, lives outside of the scope of this slide. But it's a thing. The way that you would invoke this function is that you would say mix, and then a list of things that uh, are together a really great mixture. And this is what I love. This is how I love to eat popcorn. Just mix it all together. Just kind of mash it. All these things, they implement the IFN interface. Um, <clears throat> OK, so here's another way to declare a function in Clojure. So uh, where the other function that I declared mix had a name, uh, this is an anonymous function. This is an unnamed function. And the way that it's declared is I say fn, uh, which, which is the function that takes a parameter of email and then does some stuff. This function I'm actually passing into another function. So this other function I'm passing this one email operating function into is a function called map. In Clojure, uh, and in all functional programming languages, functions are these things that you can just pass around. In the same way that you can pass around values, you can pass functions around and have functions call other functions and do things to them. So in this one, I'm passing this function email. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm passing this function that accepts an email and then uh, applies the lowercase function to whatever got passed in as the parameter. Then outside of the scope of that function, so after the, the second uh, closing paren, I've got this vector that says Mario at the strange loop and Mario Yakino at Gmail. Those are the two parameters that are passed into map. Map gets this one email function and this list of two values. And what comes out is um, the two values um, pass through the lowercase function. It's just lowercase is the strings. That's right. Ah, thanks for pointing that out. Right. 
So you've got two different kind of concepts. The sort of curly brace associative data structure where you've got a key value pair. It can be called a, a map, a hash map. Um, this other function map is called map for historical reasons. Just trust me, it's a, it, that's a name that's been used for this process of applying a function to a collection of values. Uh, it's a name that's been around since the dinosaurs. Uh, which, because Lisp has been around since the dinosaurs, and so that's probably where it originally came from. But anyway, uh, the idea is that you're passing a function in plus values, and this other function will apply that function to each of the values and then give you back whatever the return is. This is something you would use uh, in a different imperative language like Java. You might use a for loop for doing this kind of a thing. In functional languages, you've got functions that you apply functions to collections of data to that might accomplish the same thing as a for loop, um, but they do it without, more elegantly in, in my opinion, and without any side effects. Okay, another way, as a sort of variation on uh, what I showed a second ago. So before I showed an unnamed function, you can also have an anonymous function that, well, it's not really anonymous once you give it a name, uh, but you can give a name to these functions that aren't just sort of callable by anybody, but they're, they're functions that you are passing in to other functions. So here I've got a function called power uh, that takes these two parameters, uh, a number and an, uh, an exponent, and this is a, a function for calculating something to the something, power. And the way this one works is that uh, it tests if whatever the exponent is is zero, then it'll return back one. If it's not zero, it'll call itself recursively. And so that's one of the great things about uh, functional programming languages that you tend to do more things in, in recursive style than you would uh, otherwise just by accumulating state in some other way. So the way that that thing works is that it applies the multiplication function to the number that was passed in plus the return of calling itself um, by passing in the number that was originally passed in and decrementing the exponent that was passed in. So that will loop back until it gets down to, if it's zero, then return back one, and then return back uh, the whole answer as uh, 81. So this is the same as just calling um, three four times, but it does it recursively. Here is the third way to declare functions. <clears throat> so this is another anonymous and unnamed function, but it, and it's kind of a, like a shorthand way to declare functions. So in, this is another one where we're passing a function into this function called reduce, and what this function does is that it invokes this function called str, which is going to construct strings, and whatever the first parameter it was, that was passed to it is going to get passed into str, and then an empty string, uh, just you know, two quotes in a space, uh, and then the second parameter. So the percent one and percent two are the first and second parameters that were passed into this function that starts with the pound sign in print. So this is this third sort of anonymous uh, shortcut style function and I'm passing this function into reduce, and then this other data structure that has three strings, Mario, Enrique, Aquino. Uh, and so what reduce is going to do is it will take um, the first two values that are in the data structure, pass them into here, and then whatever this function call returns will be passed back in as the first parameter plus the next parameter in this sequence here as the second one. And it'll do that until it gets to the very end and then return back what the product of all of those things are. Uh, how reduce works or what it does is not so much, is not as important as uh, understanding that this is like another sort of shortcut, shorthand way of declaring functions. That's just convenient. Okay. So that's functions. <coughs> um, so I mentioned before that there's not an assignment in Clojure, that Clojure is a, a programming language that has, um, that declares things. So in the absence of being able to assign things, there's a structure called a let in uh, Clojure that is used very often, and it's the way to construct algorithms, basically, where each step in some kind of a, uh, some kind of an analysis or some kind of a, a function operation is going to be a step into a larger process. So the way that let works is uh, that you will do it typically inside of uh, a function, and you say uh, inside of these square brackets, so the left square bracket is on the left side of the min, and the right one is down here at the end of the second line, 
that the things that are being done here in the middle are going to be used outside of the parenthesis of the let, but still inside of the scope of the let. So what you do inside of the lets is in these square brackets is you build up the, basically the pieces that you're going to then put together, assemble together by the end, and the return of whatever you have done in the setup is going to be why you're using a let here. So what's going on here is that I'm saying I'm going to call min whatever is returned by uh, applying multiplication function to threshold, which is a parameter that's passed into this outside function, and this other constant 0 0.75, that I'm going to turn that into an integer, and that'll be um, what I'll call min. Then the second one down works the same way, except I'm going to call it range. And then the point of the whole thing is so that I can uh, add min to whatever rand int passed, having passed range into it returns. So I'll add those two things together, and that's going to give me the whatever the value of get rand threshold is. Let is something that uh, is used very commonly in um, Clojure for doing the set of steps. Uh, in doing your programming <coughs> in a function, and so it's important to, when you see it, to know exactly what's going on. You don't have assignment, but instead what you have is this scoped set of local variable names uh, that are, whose values are whatever it is that you put inside of the prints in the let. Okay. Macros. All right, so macros are this really powerful concept this really pow powerful facility of the language that are these compile time um, tools that at compile time it replaces code that you have uh, used in the macro with whatever the macro outputs given what you pass into it. Macros are often thought of as sort of Pandora's box kind of a thing because uh, while they're very powerful they're also something that you can get lost in and can have strange consequences. So macros are a thing that are useful in the language. The language itself, Clojure, uh, makes use of macros for a lot of the facilities that are just part of it. And I want to go over just a couple of them. Uh, so one of them is the reader macro. So the reader macro, um, we don't see this yet, but let's just say you've got this function uh, where you want to add some numbers together. OK, cool. Um, and you decide, well, what I'd like to do is Actually, I'd like to see what this function does when I um, actually replace, either replace or I, I don't want to have part of the calculation happening. Uh, and uh, so the reader macro, the way that it works is that you express, well, I'm sorry, not just the reader macro, but one of the ways that the reader macro works is that you use uh, a pound sign, and then uh, depending on what's after the pound sign, the underscore here is going to be effectively like, don't interpret this don't interpret this uh, symbol inside of the operation. So it's almost like commenting out uh, some part of the calculation, but it's not, but it doesn't stop anything else that's after it. It just uh, happens to, it's like a localized commenting out of some part of it. And so the effect of, uh, of that is that the rest of the form will evaluate, just not that one thing that you said, don't evaluate that thing. And it's a macro. Closure itself does not have a lot of language keywords. It has uh, functions and macros that together basically make up uh, the whole part uh, of, the, 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 they make up the, the whole language. It's just a composition of uh, functions and macros that can, that evaluate out to functions that you can pass parameters into. Uh, so <coughs> here is uh, an example of a different kind of a macro. So this is more of the sort of nested uh, inside out evaluation um, calls for a function. So we've got a function here called uh, read resource. And what read resource does is it takes a path. And then you got to sort of you know, build up your eye muscle here. You're going to start at the left and go all the way inside. And you're like, OK, this is the first thing that's going to be evaluated. Because this, the return value of this is going to be the parameter that's passed into that. And the return of that is going to be what gets passed into that other thing. So you've got to go a lot of back and forth to figure out what exactly is going on here. So. <clears throat> While you're trying to build up your eye muscles, you can make use of the threading macro, which lets you do things more in the order that they're actually being uh, evaluated. So the way the threading macro works is that it takes whatever the first parameter is that's passed into your series of functions, and it passes that in 
uh, like it passes that in as the first parameter of the innermost call that you're making. And the return of that is passed as the parameter to the next function that is called in a sequence. And the return of that is passed in to the next function, and so on. So basically what it does is it unwinds the set of nested uh, function calls to make it more readable. It's not something that helps necessarily the language do something better, but what it does is, uh, what it tries to do is make the, uh, the language easier for you to read and maybe even to think about. Uh, so there are lots of macros for doing this kind of things. Lots of the, um, lots of parts of the language are implemented as macros and uh, so some of the consequences of that are that things may not work in the way that you would expect them to work uh, if you didn't realize that they were macros as opposed to function calls. Um, but, uh, but, but they're still a very powerful construct of the language. So <clears throat> I've gone over a lot of stuff. Um, closure is it's a lisp. Lisps, I mentioned, are um, this family of languages that originated from the 50s um, at a time when there were sort of two camps of programming, a declarative camp and an imperative camp. The sort of Fortran and C camp were the imperatives, and the functional lisps were more the declarative. And uh, Clojure is a lisp. Uh, it's a language, as I mentioned also, it lives on the JVM. Uh, it can interoperate with Java or really any other language that lives on the JVM in one way or another. And that means that the entire Java and JVM ecosystem is available to it. Um, and it's very different from uh, OO imperative languages. So why do you care about that? Um, the reason that I care about that is I feel like when I try to adopt a completely different way of thinking about functions, about thinking about composing operations for solving problems, that forces me to get out of my comfort zone and attack uh, ideas in a different way. And I keep the ways that those things influence my thinking and apply them to the next thing that I learn. And in that way, I feel like I get uh, to be a better programmer. Uh, Clojure is one of uh, many languages that I have studied and that I really like. Um, and for anyone who would like to find out more, uh, you can read about it at Clojure.org. Uh, there's also a good book that's available online at uh, braveclosure.com. Uh, there's a website called Foreclosure, which is a series of programming exercises. Um, yeah. Uh, there are a series of programming exercises that will build up your exposure to the language in novel and interesting ways. There's also a really fantastic talk uh, by Rich Hickey called The Value of Values. Um, Rich Hickey has done a lot of uh, keynotes and other talks at conferences that are available online, and he, he generally has really, really great insights into um, programming concepts that I think uh, we don't often think about critically, but he does. Um, so anyway, that's closure. Uh, my name is Mario Aquino. You can find me on Twitter at, at MarioAquino.com. I work for a startup called Outpace. We're hiring. Uh, we do closure and a lot of other really interesting things. Uh, does anyone have any questions? And you work from home. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Um, can you convince me that that's not like a complete nightmare to debug? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that closure is not a nightmare to debug. Um, so that's a good question. Um, uh, there's, so there's so much about the language that I did not show. Um, there's really a lot more to it. Uh, and it, uh, part of what I didn't show are sort of tool support. This, I wanted this to be more a talk of how to actually parse the syntax. So one of the things that is important about closure is that everything has to be balanced. All your opening parens need to have closing parens or opening brackets, closing brackets, et cetera. So uh, in terms of a nightmare to debug, at one point it probably was a real nightmare to debug. Um, there are uh, tools available to people writing closure that watch out for that kind of balanced um, closing and opening uh, wrapping structures, whether it's parens or square brackets or curlies or whatever, um, that will make sure that you, unless you're I mean, so it's, it's possible to have unbalanced parens, but not accidentally. You have to like be intentionally be trying to Ah, right. So 
So funny thing about breakpoints. Uh, so <laughs> Clojure doesn't really have great debugging tools. Uh, so that was, for me, something that uh, took a level of adjustment. I remember when I first started doing programming, uh, my debugging uh, was print lines. And boy, I've come a long way since that. But now it's come full circle, because that's now how I do it. <laughs> I do my debugging as it is now anyway. Um, so uh, in terms of like getting your eye used to nested structures, um, you get used to it. Uh, the more you read it, the more it makes sense to the eye. Plus, your eye muscle gets stronger. So that's a fantastic point, and that's something that I did not mention at all in this talk. So uh, Clojure is a language that has a REPL, and REPL stands for read, eval, uh, print, and loop. So it's just uh, a command prompt, basically, where you can express uh, commands to uh, a working interpreter that will tell you the value of things, you can declare functions, you can investigate things. So that is a really, really common way to write Clojure, where you've got uh, an editor open for writing your code, and then you have a REPL session where you type commands out and just try stuff out. In, uh, so I came to Clojure from Ruby. Ruby also has a REPL, but I, I didn't end up using it as much because my feedback mechanism in Ruby was generally through tests. And in Clojure, there are many options for writing automated tests, but it's more like, I think culturally, it's more common for uh, Closure or any Lisp developers to have a REPL open and to try things out in the REPL and, and when they figure out something that works, then you put it into your source and then just sort of iterate your development in that way. Um, that's very, very common. Uh, so, yeah, and any other questions? Go ahead. So Clojure is a dynamically typed programming language that operates on data structures, uh, period. Uh, the, where languages that may be strongly and statically typed will use type declarations to make sure that you are passing uh, something that, uh, that is intended to be the recipient of some set of uh, operations inside of a method or a static function call. Uh, Clojure doesn't have that, and there are lots of languages that don't have that, too. And what they tend to do instead is think about things in terms of the shape of data. Not necessarily the type of data, but the shape of it. Functions uh, in Clojure will take uh, data structures that they will uh, do some kind of either investigation and manipulation of, or compose other things that wrap whatever is passed into them. The absence of strong static typing in Clojure means that you can write functions that can operate in a more general sense on data structures that may or may not always be the same kind of things, but will likely have or have to have the same shape. Um, so, yeah. Clojure thinks more about shapes than types. Okay. Question. Good question. So the question is, uh, Clojure is on top of the JVM, and that's supposed to be a good thing, right? <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I'd say that it can be a good thing. <laughs> uh, is the uh, interoperability with Java painful? Um, it can be painful. Um, 
What you, what I have found, and it's true with Clojure as with other languages that are built on top of larger eco ecosystems, is that you tend to prefer to stay inside of your language uh, for as much as you can. And to the extent that you need to call out to something that is not implemented in your language, you do that through uh, a channel where you make, you basically make accommodations for the ways that the world are, is different outside of your world and try to localize those things in function calls where you treat the outside world as a thing uh, that is a, you pass something in and you get something back and you try not to do some sort of a conversational interaction. Um, so that's definitely true with a, a number of languages that have, that are built on top of other things. I think it's true for closure. Question. Ha! Ah. <laughs> so We're dropping bombs in this room. Ask, step back and ask, what problem am I trying to solve with this Java framework? And is that as trivial as passing a function? Go ahead. What, what type of thing would you build with Clojure? Anything. So, I mean, because you know, if I think of Ruby or PHP, I think, okay, yeah. Right, I guess the general purpose for is Clojure a general purpose programming language, or is it one of those that's like, oh, well, you know, I would only use it if I'm Good question. So Clojure is, uh, it's a lisp, and so it's great at lists of things. So if you've got like a to-do list or a shopping list, Clojure, definitely go to Clojure. And if you've got lists of gigantic amounts of data that you want to operate uh, on, that you want to do uh, interesting analysis on, uh, so that's actually what we do at the company where I work. Um, we use Clojure to be able to deal with uh, large amounts of data and not have to worry about uh, mutability in what we're doing in, in interacting with it. Um, so you can definitely do this with uh, Java, it's just there are things that you have to do, there's more work that you have to do in Java to accomplish the same things that you do, that you get just out of the box by default with closure and immutable uh, persistent data structures. Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, as we are approaching a world where the speed of processors isn't uh, growing s as fast as the number of processors, number of cores that are being put into a, uh, into a chip, uh, being able to parallelize processing and think about um, computing in parallel and languages that make that thing easier, make the process of parallelization easier, it is definitely to our advantage to start looking at languages like that. Um, Clojure is a language that does uh, parallel processing very well, and there are others too. Uh, I think functional programming languages that deal with pure functions uh, that don't allow for a mutable state um, inside of, uh, across interactions, they eliminate a thing that you otherwise have to guard against uh, that makes it harder to operate in parallel environments. So I think Clojure, and we're using that where I work now, uh, we're using Clojure specifically for that reason. Uh, and though that there are trade-offs. So there are some things, I mean, so Clojure is not, uh, the whole silver bullet thing, that whole analogy is just so used, right? But uh, Clojure is not a, a magical language. It's a language that has trade-offs. Um, and um, you can use those trade-offs to your benefit depending on what your use cases are. Uh, in, in parallel execution is something that Clojure does well and there are other languages, uh, functional or otherwise, that do a lot of uh, parallel processing well. So, yes, we have parallel process closure to some considered. Where would you, where would you avoid closure? Mm. Well, so if, uh, I guess that there are environments where you can't use um, closure, like uh, for mobile applications, for example, where uh, the language is just not uh, available for that for doing like system operations where things like a, um, you know, a shell language makes more sense um, or is like easily there that doesn't require you to 
uh, like, I don't know, install the JDK or whatever, uh, you have, or maybe if you're in an environment where you don't have other people who are experienced in a functional paradigm who are just using uh, an imperative programming model and that's just what you know, um, there are, I guess, lots of reasons why you might use something other than closure. Um, but again, it's just a question of trade-offs. I wouldn't say necessarily that there are problems that closure cannot do. Uh, I, I can't think of them. There may be some, um, but I mean, like in terms of why you would choose not to try to introduce closure, um, I guess it depends on what your needs are. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's because of any kind of limitation on the language for practical reasons. Question? Well, so uh, as in Java, you've got uh, garbage collection that happens uh, behind the scenes. So in Clojure, you don't do any kind of uh, allocation or uh, releasing of memory. Uh, it all just sort of takes, gets taken, taken care of. So, right, I hear you. So the question is, how does memory management really work in Clojure? So uh, Clojure has a compiler that emits a Java bytecode. Um, so the, for the same way that uh, the Java programming language and the, the, the garbage collector in Java looks for references to things, the Clojure compiler, it emits Java bytecode instruction uh, that will operate in the same way that compiled Java works inside the JVM and it manages, like so where there may not be uh, assignment to variables in Clojure explicitly behind the scenes, uh, how it all works is something that's compatible with the garbage collector and the JVM. So it's utterly possible to experience out-of-memory exceptions in any language that runs in the JVM. Um, so yeah, but the running out of memory is something that um, may happen to just depending on what it is that you're operating on. You may be operating on some amount of data that's beyond the heap space of uh, the JVM, and it's to you to figure out how to manage that better. In a good way.
Question. Uh, so, I, I don't have a lot of experience with the closure script, so I may not give you the best answer to this question, but what uh, I do know is that uh, closure script is, so for anyone in the room who hasn't heard of it, closure script is a, uh, it is writing closure that uh, a compiler will take and turn into JavaScript that can run in the browser. And what you have access to in closure script is uh, basically uh, all of the closure language that will get compiled down to something that can run in the browser. And there are lots of really novel and innovative ways that that's being used for doing uh, either asynchronous processing in the browser uh, or um, other ways of doing um, data manipulation in a functional style, which is also possible in JavaScript, because JavaScript is a language that you can write in a functional uh, paradigm. Um, but it's arguably easier to do in Clojure. Uh, so your question is, um, is th are there ways to have uh, Clojure used, like uh, have common functions used both in the server side and on the client side uh, via Clojure script? And definitely. I mean, that, that's because you've got access to um, Clojure functional uh, code that you write uh, or libraries that you make available those can be turned into JavaScript by the compiler and effectively reuse the same stuff in the client that you might be using in the server. Any other questions? All right, thanks very much.